we were looking at the trends that were happening with carpal tunnel syndrome diagnosis. And we have some unique resources here for looking at the experience of our county. And in particular, we know all of the incident cases when a person first developed that diagnosis in our population here in the county. And so I was able to look at that, both the incidence of the diagnosis and whether it was changing, and could do that over a very long period of time. We started with the cases that were diagnosed in 1981, and we followed it through 2005. And what we saw in that group was that in the mid-1980s, there was an acceleration of the diagnoses of carpal tunnel syndrome in our county, and actually continued to increase throughout the whole study period, which was 25 years. So what we looked at was, what was very interesting, I thought, is we looked at the, the, the work-related population, and when we did that, we saw that there was indeed an epidemic in that particular group, and it also started in the mid-1980s and went through about the mid-1990s, and what was really interesting is that trend pretty much ended at the, in, in the mid-1990s. Uh, at about the same time, we saw this happening in the general population, so not considered work-related. Um, and the difference was is that in that particular population, the trend continued to increase. The big con concern that we have coming along, or the thing to look at, is the fact that when you look at the end of this study and you're seeing this big bump in surgical treatment, uh, we're going to see as our population ages, we're going to be seeing more people coming in. This group's likely going to be more uh, likely to need an operation, carpal tunnel release. And so one of the follow-up studies was looking at uh, what are the predictors of disability in a particular employment group that might explain, you know, why they'd be having trouble at work. What can what individual factors contribute to that. Right now we are looking at a couple of things beyond this. There, there's been a, a publication from others that have looked at the, the trends in carpal tunnel release and they are increasing much as we, we showed in our study. But however, the more interesting part about it is that the national rates of carpal tunnel release are considerably higher than our local rates. Um, and we're trying to understand that because the indications for having some of these surgical procedures that are considered elective are very individual, they're regional. And we look at things like carpal tunnel syndrome, some areas have higher rates of surgical release than others, despite the same incidence and same populations. And so we're looking at whether how this has to do with practice variations. One of the practical problems that we have when we see people with these conditions is what is the best way to treat these conditions? Uh, are there ways to reduce the disability that comes with these conditions? Unlike a specific, a specific condition, like you either have carpal tunnel syndrome or you don't, and people that have it are more likely to be people that are obese versus not obese. When I talk about disability, it's not quite that clear what factors play into that, and, and there's likely multiple, as indeed there are. And so what I wanted to do was to look at a working group of people and use a, a measure of disability, a standardized measure. What we did is we took a, a group of uh, our transcriptionists that are here. We are a very large medical center, so we have a nice population. But it's a specific group that does a lot of hand-intensive activities. And then ask them about these different factors. You know, how, what about your job satisfaction? What about your level of perceived stress? How stressful do you think certain things are? Uh, and whether they had seen somebody, a practitioner in the past, with a musculoskeletal condition or not that involved their hands or upper extremities. When we came back and looked at and broke them down into their categories and looked at, at this, the strongest factors, the people that were more likely to have high levels of disability, actually had medical conditions. Uh, it turned out that the di people who had diabetes were more likely to have hand disability than those that weren't. And the other big group were people that had had tr prior treatment for this. Uh, but the other thing that we did, in did confirm is that people that had higher levels of perceived stress seemed to have more disability. From a, a personal standpoint, and particularly pertinent to the, re the field of rehabilitation, is that what are the optimal ways to rehabilitate people that have these conditions? You could see when we get people referred to us, some of these factors that are measurable in, the, in, a, in a population that's not a patient population, 
what you're going to find is you're going to find individuals that are in the work comp system, so to speak, are going to have higher levels of stress associated with that. So a lot of these other factors that typically are not addressed adequately as part of treatment are going to impact their level of disability. And so as we design rehabilitation programs for that, we need to address all of these other issues if our goal is to lower disability and to have people remain in the workplace. And I think the important take-home message is a lot of these factors that we see in the office for people that come in is that a lot of these people are under significant amounts of stress when they're going through this kind of stuff. And you can kind of see the direct implications that we can't ignore that. That needs to be treated. We need multidisciplinary programs. And that's really the rehab model for, for treating these.